Oh, wow, I had my microphone muted this entire time. Well, that's funny. Anyway, I'm Jonathan, I'm Quixel's community manager, and I just made a giant fool of myself, but that's nothing new. It happens occasionally, right? So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is my first solo live stream since 2016. I am ex super excited to cover this. I see chat going crazy with there's no sound. Uh, don't worry, I just fixed it. We always have some kind of issue with live streams. It's, it's just kind of a curse that happens to us. So my <laughs> sincere apologies for this one. Should have checked it double, double twice, you know. Uh, anyway, as I was talking and, and trying to talk with my microphone muted, I will now cover uh, the, uh, <laughs> the entire topic I was trying to get to, which is that this entire scene is something that was super important to me. Uh, this is actually from an area like just north of where I grew up, uh, about maybe a mile away. And there was a couple of kids I used to hang out with and we would kind of hop the fence over here. Obviously this is an unreal, so you can't really see, but just pretend there's houses over there and like a, like a metal chain link fence. And we would hop over from here and just come into this area where there's like vines and Spanish moss hanging down and these massive Southern Oak, best known as live Oak trees. Uh, and the reason why they're called live Oaks is because they don't drop leaves in the sense that most trees do when they're, um, Dedish, or deciduous yeah that's the, that's the term deciduous trees like they're evergreen uh, which is weird because most oak trees are deciduous and they actually drop their leaves and when winter time comes they're completely barren but live oaks actually have green leaves all year long even though the floor is completely covered in leaves dead leaves so they, they drop constantly but they never actually lose all their leaves so they're, they're kind of a unique fixture in the south and to me, to, to get the particular look and feel, I had to research this. So when you saw me pop up here earlier with uh, Speed Tree open, and you could see what I was working with, uh, a big part of the scene was working in Speed Tree to get what I needed to do done in a reasonable amount of time that wasn't kind of like banging my head on the wall trying to model this in, in uh, traditional 3D software. I used Speed Tree, and, and I'm so happy that I did because this made my job so much easier uh, to a point where I could spend more time focusing on the art and less on trying to get technical details in because ultimately I'm trying to create a memory and memories are by nature very um, unreliable, right? So what you remember and what you think of are completely different than in many cases what actually happened. So my memories of this particular scene are colored by my experiences and what I lived through. Uh, this is generally what it looked like, but it's more of an idealized scene. You're never going to find fog like this in Florida, where I live. And, you know, I've heard all the Florida man jokes. Don't worry, I'm not crazy. <laughs> I just live here, after all. But to get that memory feel, a big part of the scene was trying to make this look like it was a hazy afternoon slash morning kind of feel. And I could have baked the lighting, I could have done a lot of things, but ultimately what I ended up doing was working with this as though it would just be completely dynamic. Uh, I wasn't really terribly concerned with performance. I just wanted to make this, I just wanted to get this idea down, get this you know, from my head in, in digital form as fast as I could in a way that I wouldn't lose the, the, the feeling of like remembrance and, and um, I'd say a bit of melancholy that goes with it where you're, you're, you're remembering days of your youth where I'm, I'm 35 now. So everything that I'm seeing here, I'm drawing on memories from almost 20 years ago. So, and actually maybe even further, I think I was only 12 when I was actually playing in these woods. Uh, they don't even exist anymore. They got turned into a subdivision uh, and they were bulldozed. Uh, one of the things I left out of the scene is that these trees actually had orange tape on them. And being a kid, I didn't know what that meant, but that meant that they were marked for being cut down and bulldozed and destroyed. So this entire area was just marked for destruction long before I even set in it and before I knew what building codes were or uh, land use rights, any of that stuff. I was just a kid and I just saw something that I thought looked really amazing. Uh, and to me, it, it kind of, it's one of those memories that's always stuck with me. And it's kind of sad that it doesn't exist anymore, but that's, you know, the power of memory is that you can bring these things back to life as an artist. So I can see there's a ton of messages coming in and I'm not sure if, if what I said before with my microphone being muted actually came through, probably not. So I'm going to say that 
I can't actually type and talk simultaneously, so I'm going to try to read back as much as I can and try to engage with you guys as much as I can. So one of the first questions that I noticed with this um, that, that just popped up is what were my computer specs? Uh, I mean, what are they actually even currently? This is a mid-range PC on an i7-6700K with a GTX 1080 Ti and 32 gigabytes of RAM. So it's, you know, the RAM is, is it's pretty good. Uh, the processor is kind of mid-range now, and the 1080 Ti is still, I would think it's still considered mid to high end now with the RTX cards having come out. Uh, it doesn't run terribly fast. I'm getting currently 20 frames, but this is because I'm using completely dynamic lighting and because these trees are polygonal hell. I specifically chose to make these trees using individual tree leaves inside of SpeedTree to make my interpretation of these live oaks come to fruition in a way that I thought would be most accurate. Uh, if you look in the Megascans library, for example, let me load up Bridge and I'll show you. We have a lot of plant atlases, and they tend to be rather large um, components, right? They're, they're large surfaces. And these atlases tend to have, like, they have a defined surface area. So if you're trying to get individual leaves, you're not going to get that same level of fidelity that you're going to get from actually hand placing the leaves and hand, or, or even, you know, procedurally generating them. So to get the leaves to be exactly where I wanted them to be was going to require me actually setting them in speed tree manually. So I'll go back to speed tree in a second, but to really illustrate, I kind of have to go in here and tell the, uh, the bridge exactly what I'm looking for. And funny enough, these are the same leaves that I use, these bay leaves right here. Uh, we don't actually have live oaks because we haven't scanned any part of the state that I live in yet, uh, which I'm hoping we do. I'd love to go out and, and join the scanning teams for an adventure in the woods, maybe go scan a crocodile or alligator or two. But as you can see, like with our, our atlases, when you have these pre-made clusters of leaves, you can't really get the same level of fidelity that you can get from hand placing every one of these leaves. So when I went into speed tree, you'll notice that every one of these particular components is its own leaf and they're all attached to a relatively low res set of branches and twigs. And in doing so, I was able to define exactly where these leaves are going to be placed using reference photos of the trees right outside of my house because my neighborhood is full of these types of trees. And I was able to figure out the growth patterns uh, because these, these trees tend to kind of grow gnarly. They're not exactly straight. They, they grow very twisty and turny and they kind of look crinkled. Uh, and they're very sharp too. These aren't trees you really want to run into. Uh, their leaves are very sharp and they're kind of obnoxious, but they're they're beautiful to look at. Uh, I absolutely love the, the canopy that they provide. I made six different variations of these trees and that is literally all you're seeing in this scene is six trees rotated and placed by hand. And even these bushes, uh, fun enough, these are actually trees. I, I've felt for the, <laughs> the longest time that why should I need to make a bush when it's pretty much just the top part of a tree with the branches sticking into the ground? That's pretty much what they are. And since the woods around my estate, like they actually look like this, it seemed easy enough for me to essentially just recreate it by trying to do the least amount of work possible. Because ultimately it was about recreating a feeling, not so much about creating real life. So let me check chat, make sure I'm not getting too lost in the weeds here with talking. But I also have to drink some water. I talk way too much, as you guys can tell. But uh, yeah, like I said, <laughs> I love the comment that I'm seeing now. Oh, my God, genius using trees as bushes. But it's seriously such a time saver. You're probably never going to do this at a AAA studio, and I'm not going to pretend that you would. But for me, trying to do what I was doing... Um, it really worked. It worked well. And in combination with the rest of the assets and, and using uh, existing foliage for leaves and whatnot as scatter assets, it made my job so much easier. I was able to focus on the work, to focus on the memory that I was trying to recreate, to, to essentially Bob Ross this. And if Bob Ross is not a verb, well, I just made it one. So I Bob Rossed this thing. I just made happy little trees wherever I could put them, rotated them, twisted them, turned them, adjusted them until I got them to where I wanted them to be to get that hallway kind of feel that I really wanted to get. 
Uh, so one of the questions that I'm seeing now, and I, I really apologize if I missed any, it's very tough to run a stream and keep engaged with the chat at the same time. So if I miss anything, please don't hesitate to repeat yourself. I will gladly engage with you if I can see it. Uh, but Jemena Mukshil, I apologize if I'm mutilating your, your name. <laughs> Forgive me, please. Uh, he wants to know, is this bad for having more polygons? I'm sorry for asking questions, but I'm new to this. And that's okay. That's what this stream's all about. I'm here to help you to share knowledge that I've had over the years. Uh, because ultimately, you know, we're the sum of our parts. We learn from other, each other. We learn from people who have come before us and done these things. So it's, it's great to be able to assist and help out and teach people what I know uh, for what I like to do. So more polygons is not bad in and of itself. Uh, in this particular case, I wasn't really concerned with performance. I'm just trying to make something I think looks nice. Uh, I was trying to create something that I thought would make people happy, that I thought would make me happy, because ultimately I look at personal art as kind of like therapy in a way, where I get to focus on just bringing ideas and thoughts in my head to life in a way that really, I don't know, makes me feel content, I guess is the best way to put it. And, and being an artist here at Quixel, it really isn't my primary duty. I, I, I lead the support team, so if you've ever had to send in a support ticket, you've probably talked to me once or twice in email. I also handle sales and some other stuff in the company. I, I have my hands on a lot of things, but ultimately I always make time for art because I was a production artist for six years in the military simulation industry, which is nowhere near as creative as what I do here. I would never be able to convince anybody from that industry to let me sit down and just make something amazing like this. Or, or, well, let me not toot my horn too much. Amazing to me. Uh, ultimately, whether you agree or not is, is a matter of opinion, so I, I don't want to come off as pretentious. But, yeah, um, let's see what else I can cover. So, as a hobbyist, I can't afford mega scans, which is what Pickyob said. Uh, we have pretty affordable price, pricing plans when it comes to the site, so if you guys have issues with payment, uh, you should look into the cheapest hobbyist plan that we have which is actually called personal light i believe and it should actually offer you a good set of assets to work with in terms of <clears throat> what robin chuan just said i'd like to see that place on a rainy day that would be neat uh, i don't think i have the time currently to actually set that up it would require a bit of effort to change the sky out and some other things although i'm gonna level with you guys the sky is literally nothing it is just the default unreal sky with no sky dome I was going to place a dome with an HDR, but then I realized you would never see it, and it would actually ultimately detract from what I was trying to do, uh, especially with all the camera adjustments that I had to make. So when I went in here and made all the camera adjustments to really get that hazy summer's day memory feel, I did not want clouds in the background to kind of change the way the sky looked to the tree branches. So, and again... If you guys have any questions or concerns, please, like at any point, reach out, chat. I will, I'd love to answer questions. So if you guys want to know anything, by all means, ask. And actually, that being said, Ali just asked, is the ground using displacement? It is not. This is a standard Unreal Terrain. It might look like it has displacement, but that is really and ultimately just an illusion. So let's see if I can... I'm not even going to try to solo this. That might actually cause issues in real time. But... I'll hide some aspects of this particular scene that you can you can actually see what the terrain looks like without foliage and without some other assets in the way. So this is all hand painted and it's all minimal hand painting. And literally even the uh, terrain paint itself is it's all height based. So I took the albedo map and then took or took one of the channels out, went into Photoshop and applied one of those channels is an alpha map with and clamp the values to get a nice harsh transition uh you can kind of see it here as some of the dirt kind of pops through it, it doesn't look great up close but from a distance it kind of holds up also it was really meant to be taken in concert with the rest of these leaves and these roots so when you take it as the sum of the parts rather than a piece by itself it tends to work a lot better uh one thing yeah is uh Let's see, MPC 212-93948 says, Yeah, dude, get those particle dust fireflies slash leaves in there. That is a good point. One thing I forgot was to put dust in here. But let, let's let's get back to the, uh, the main discussion here. Um, one of the things that I found technically challenging when I was working on this was trying to get this abstract idea 
into Unreal in, in a way that like people could look at it and recognize what it was that I was trying to go for. Uh, and that was probably the hardest bit of all of this to me personally. Uh, I, I tend to, to have issues with scale. I tend to make things way too large if I don't have proper references and I'm not constantly keeping an eye on what I'm doing. And what I could have easily done was make these trees way too large in relation to the rest of the scene. And what would have ended up doing is it would have taken the scene and completely destroyed the sense of uh, grandeur I was trying to go for, where the trees don't look like they're in proportion to the rest of the world. Uh, then you look at it and your brain instinctively knows this doesn't really make any sense. And when you look at it like that, it kind of destroys the illusion that you're going for. So that's, that's, a, that's something you have to be cognizant of. And I was definitely trying my best to remember was not to let scale be my enemy on this because when you go to speed tree and you look inside of it you have a little human next to it right so where's he at he's hiding in the shadows over here so this is actually about the size of these trees in reality but one of the things i had to do when i was placing these trees was figure out how am i going to keep the scale accurate even though it gets translated from speed tree and brought into to unreal so a lot of it was eyeballing too and again, when you're coming in here, like like I said maybe earlier, you guys may have missed it, I, I literally made only six different types of trees. So a lot of this is illusion. I'm trying to make the same thing not repeat too much, and I kind of felt that six would be a good number, because otherwise I'd spend a week just making trees. And as much as I love foliage, and as much as I love how speed tree makes it very easy for me to work with Megascans data, I don't love trees to the point where I just want to stare at them for a week straight. So I really wanted to get in here and just get my ideas down as fast as I could uh, so I didn't lose interest. When you when you get into the zone, right, you guys know what that's like. You try your best to, to stay in there so that you don't lose the progress that you're making. And that, that was, that was a, t a t constant worry in the back of my mind that I wouldn't be able to finish this in time. Um, and I'll get with Lost and with Dan's question just in a moment. But one thing I wanted to mention is that this scene actually took me only 18 hours. I busted it out over the, the span of a weekend and a couple of weeknights. Uh, so Speed Tree, working with Mega Scans, both of those combined with a little bit of 3D Studio Max to make the leaves around the atlases that I had, was what made the speed possible for me. So Lost with Dan wants to know, how important are reference images for scenes modeling etc should he focus more on using images for reference instead of trying to replicate stuff himself i am 100 percent behind the thought that i learned in art college which is that when i was being taught how to draw the idea is that you need to draw what you see not what you think you see so when you apply that same principle to what you're looking at and trying to create in 3d you need to study the references that you're working with. You need to take them into consideration and try to try to replicate as much as you can from what it is that you're trying to create. When I was working with Live Oaks and trying to get this particular feel of this hall of trees, I had quite a few reference images up, uh, mostly in my Opera browser, so I don't have them with me currently. But it looked very much like this. Uh, the trees had individual little pieces of um, moss and, and little tidbits and doodads growing off of them to kind of break them up and make them look a little bit more interesting. Uh, the Spanish moss that I hung was done in a way that, that it would actually grow in real life, which isn't really hard to reference because I can just walk down my street and see this stuff. It's, it's pretty much everywhere where I live. So essentially, uh, references are everything. If I didn't have references for this, it would not have looked good. Uh, I, this is, to me, I'm, I'm, this is one of the best things I felt like I've ever made. And I've made a lot of stuff, and I'm very happy with how this came out. I'm, I'm astonished at the re reception it's gotten. Um, I try to think of myself as a pretty humble person, so when I talked about 18 hours, I wasn't trying to brag. It was more about how impressed that I was that these tools exist that allow me to make these things in the time frame that I am. So it's, it's something to keep in mind. It's These modern workflows that we have are really kind of like a way to to unlock the potential and creativity that pretty much everybody has uh every one of you guys can do this i i, I don't see any reason why you can't you just have to spend a couple of minutes and, and come up with an idea that you really feel drawn to and then spend the time to make it um with with mega scans speed tree your favorite modeling package 
anything is really possible. It, it, it's, it's really more about what can you think of and create rather than how can I technically get to that point? So let's see. Uh, Danny wants to know, how did I do the Spanish moss hanging on the trees? That's another bit of Max. Uh, essentially, the Spanish moss is one of our bridge atlases. So let's put, type that in up here. All right, so I actually only used one of these. And the one that I used, I believe, was this one right here. And I actually just, I literally just traced around this with geometry. Uh, if, if you watched the last stream that I did with Adnan, um, I kind of chimed in about how I do this too. Just trace around with a basic amount of geo. And then I made this into an X card. So I'll show you what that looks like in a second. So an X card, uh, for those of you guys who have never worked with foliage geo, it's a super simplistic, old school way of doing this stuff. Uh, there's probably better ways. Uh, I may have been able to do, what do you call it? Uh, camera facing polygons where this actually like wherever I rotate it, it always faces the same direction. I was worried that it would kind of look samey if I did that. So I allowed myself to be able to scale and rotate these things by working with X cards. Okay. And if you see what I'm selecting, it's really, really simple, right? But it looks like it has so much more depth because I'm actually using a custom moss shader that I built. Uh, and it's not, you know, the most amazing material ever, but I'll show it to you guys if you'd like to see it. I just got to figure out where it's at in my scene. So let me open up the mesh so that we can look at it, and then we'll go right back into the material instance. And then from there, we will open up the foliage shader. There we go. So I've got a couple of uh, different nodes that I use for this stuff. So I have subsurface set up in here, and this all powers the subsurface color, which is what's being shown to you when you look at these uh, the, these foliage bits through the trees, or sorry, the, when the sun lights it up from behind. Uh, let me get the material back. It kind of just popped off my screen there. Oh, there it is. Unreal has this interesting tendency to completely and utterly minimize something to the, the smallest extent it can possibly be if you, if you drag it off. See what I mean? <laughs> so anyway, back to the point. Um, so I've got these material functions that I've built that pretty much power everything. And it looks kind of complex at first glance, but really it's nothing more than essentially Photoshop levels to control the strength of these assets. So if you look at this as just like a, a levels pass, it just gives me the ability to customize these things on the fly. I'll show you how that works too in a minute. But ultimately what I used was a fuzzy shading node, and that should be under the base color and it may actually be inside of here, as I recall. Yep, there it is. So fuzzy shading is the way Unreal works with our fuzz maps, or in general, just anything that we would want to look like a carpet or like velvet, or in this case, Spanish moss, which would by nature have a specific type of shading to it, which you can't really replicate with a standard shader. And the fuzzy shading node gives it that characteristic darkness in the center. Without that fuzzy shading node, these Spanish moss components in the in the scene look really flat. Uh, you can you can kind of see it at work here. I could have probably gone a little further and added some more geo to it to kind of prevent this X shape from being apparent, but I never intended for you to get this close to it. So try to ignore that when you're looking at it. it it's not really too apparent here. Um, but yeah, that that. I was actually going to cover how the uh, instances work, too. I, I'm sorry, I don't normally run these by myself. It, it's been like something that we've been sharing duties with. I'm trying to remember everything I can show you guys all at once. So one of the cool things that I mentioned that I would talk about was the subsurface strength and the other instances that I have in here. These are all parameters that I've set up in the material to make changing anything on the fly something that you can just do without having to recalculate stuff. You, you guys are probably all familiar with material instances. So this is the most powerful part of Unreal for me to make this kind of work. So essentially, like I've got everything in here set up so that I can, I can get that darkness on the moss any way I want it to look. I can change the brightness of the texture itself. I can make it as dark or as bright as I want. It's, it's amazing uh, the, the level of control you get on this stuff. And in addition, I can even control the levels of the alpha, too, to make it stronger or less apparent. Just at any point, come in here and just change it. 
Uh, I even have the normal set up so that they're a, a bit stronger and they read significantly more detailed from a distance. Uh, that's that's an old school UDK technique that I've picked up on that I used to use back when I made UDK maps. But if you see me change the, the details in this, this mesh, you can see how that they don't, like when I've set the normals back down, they don't catch the light anywhere near as well and they look really flat. But if I put the normal strength, like if I if I set the, the blue value down to 0.5 and set the R and uh, green, or so the red and green channels to 12, suddenly they pick up all the light. Each individual strand of the moss gets hit by the light and it just looks cool. It looks like Spanish moss. The, the scans themselves are, to me, amazing. I mean, the technology that, that we've built at Quixel to, to make this stuff a reality, that you guys can take this and put it into any game engine and have it look good is, is great. But there's steps that you got to take beyond just this looks good. Uh, you need to build your materials to leverage what you have. And, and some of that is making the normal data just pop out more. Uh, some of that is changing the colors to be what you want it to be. Don't be afraid to mess with this stuff to make it stronger or make it look different. There's, there's really no wrong way to work with scan data. The, the only way I would arguably say anything is wrong is if it doesn't look good. And if even if it's scanned and you think it looks perfect, but someone else says, eh, it could be a little stronger. It, there's nothing wrong with really taking that opinion and, and trying to work with it. I mean, I, I had friends over while I was working on this and had their opinions on it too. So, all right, let me go back to the chat and see if I'm missing anything. Um, Spirit has issues with the plugin. For issues with the plugin, I cannot provide support on a live stream. Please email support at quixel.com for assistance. We'll get with you as soon as we can. Uh, for Vitor, he wants to know, how do these tools that enable faster and more intuitive approaches to game art in general when you're not necessarily into the more realistic approach? Uh, essentially, in general, the, the, the tools that we provide at Quixel allow you to spend more time on the art and less time on the technical details. That's, that's the, the long story short. I don't want to spend too much time talking about Megascans. The, I think it's proven itself as a, as a valuable tool in the industry in general. So really it's more about you get to focus on making reality out of your dreams, out of your ideas, out of your hopes. To, to be able to build that in a very short amount of time is nothing short of incredible to me because I'm old enough to know what it was like to have to make every single one of these assets by hand. And let me tell you, when I had to do that, it didn't look anywhere near as good. Uh, I'll make a long story short. I went to George Washington's estate up in Virginia slash Maryland, maybe. And there was a beautiful part of the backwoods of his area, uh, like his house that I wanted to create and had this awesome little fence on the side and, and all these giant trees that were like they had dropped all their leaves over the ground i tried making that all by hand and i look at it now six years later and i'm like wow uh this i i wow uh, what i'm doing with mega scans completely floors that because mega scans brings my quality level up to a bare minimum i don't have to spend all that time making the leaves i don't have to spend all that time making the tree bark going out taking pictures of stuff to then turn into a texture and, and hope that i can get it to look good in photoshop I can just take it directly from our scan library, toss it in, make it look the way I want it to look. I've already got that base level of quality. That's the magic of what we do. And the, the way that all these tools, like you can make mega scans integrate with SpeedTree, as I've shown you. Uh, I may not have gone over the in-depth part. We'll, we'll get to that before this, this stream's over. Um, but the way it integrates, and you can actually see a preview of what it's gonna look like in the end, is nothing short of breathtaking to me. That I can spend time making what I wanna make and not have to fight with, essentially with myself, my limitations and my issues of, of being an artist, I can get over that and just focus on making what I want to do, what I want to create. Uh, ASCII wants to know, when will it be possible to make transparent mi uh, materials in Mixer? That I do not know. I wish I could, I could answer that. That is something only the development team knows currently. I suspect it will be possible eventually, but there's a lot of great stuff coming to Mixer soon. So you guys should keep an eye out for that. We'll cover that as soon as we can. Um, let's see. Adelia says, your sun looks perfect. When I turn on race racing, the sun becomes a giant glow. Do you know what's up with it? I do not. I actually don't have uh, ray tracing. I'm not even using ray tracing here. This, if you want to know how I set up the lighting, it's super simple. It is literally a blown out sun. Uh, the sun is set to, let's see, where's the light? There it is. Okay, so the lighting, I'll show you the actual lighting settings. The lighting is set to 50, which is absurd. Uh, you should never use something that high unless you have a specific use case for it. Uh, 
try not to listen to artists when they tell you that you should never do something at any point ever. There's always an application for something. Uh, 50 on this, on this range is a completely arbitrary value. I typed in what I thought would look good. If I'd gone to 100, it becomes way too blown out. If I come to 200, it's really blown out and it looks like I left my camera on too long. 25 might have worked, but it left a lot of the trees in shadow. I felt like 50 was just the right range. Ultimately, uh, I also picked a like a more orange color to the sun, just slightly. I used the, the, the sun temperature, so I went from this blue value of normal sunlight and changed it to match where the sun would be at this time of day so that the sun was more orange and kind of had like a nice haze to it. Um, let's see what else did I do to this making sure that it, it actually fogs the environment so when the sun hits the environment and hits the fog it actually contributes the value of the sun into the fog itself it's one of those great things about unreal uh, the light shaft occlusion makes this completely without the light shaft occlusion it's way too bright with uh the light shaft bloom without that it doesn't look anywhere near as good either everything that i've chosen in here contributes in some form or another to the final product so it's it was a constant game of, of figuring out which tiny value to change without changing the overall composition. So that's that was a big part of the lighting. So whenever somebody says, how did you do the lighting in this? Sometimes I feel bad when I say it was literally just nothing more than a dynamic light, a dynam literally a dynamic sunlight. And then beyond that, just a skylight set to 2.5 with uh, distance field ambient occlusion set up with it. That's literally all it is. If I turn off the DFAO and set this to stationary, look how much worse that looks. Like, it just becomes much more bright and overbright and unnaturally bright. The DFAO, especially for foliage, makes all the difference in the way these scenes look in the outdoors. But it's one of those really expensive techniques that's bringing the frame rate down to nothing in here for me. Like, 15 frames a second is not what I would consider real time. Um, and I am, uh, to answer Cave's question, I am actually using volumetric fog. And the settings for that, pretty basic. I didn't even bother using any uh, fog like particles. It's just a an exponential height fog actor, which should be right here. Or that may be atmospheric. Okay, that's atmospheric. And that's an exponential in here somewhere. Ah, oh, there it is. So it's almost all basic levels. Like the only thing I did was turn on volumetric. Other than that, the extinction scale was brought up just a little bit. If you push it too far, it becomes too strong. If you don't push it, it doesn't contribute very much. It was trying to find that sweet spot between too much and too little, trying to find that just right. And a lot of this is experimentation. You never know until you try. You're never going to know what it's going to look like until you just commit yourself to, to attempting it. So, yeah, I, I'm... Again, I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, a lot of the questions in here are great. I'm trying my best to keep up with chat. It is very tough to run the stream and talk to people at the same time, but uh, you guys are being very patient with me, and I really appreciate that. Uh, let's see if I have any other questions. Okay, Ali wants to know, is there any processing being done, or is the light doing all the work? Great question. Let's attach, or let's actually select this camera so you can see it, and I will show you the details of what I did. There is post-processing being used, but no, um, no LUTs. It's all just being done in the color grading. So I adjusted the shadows to bring up the shadows a bit. Like I could have brought them up more, could have brought them up less. Uh, let's see here. I just brought them up slightly. I kind of made them more saturated too. Without the extra saturation, I kind of felt like they, uh, it just didn't really pull the scene together as well. It's really subtle. You kind of have to really stare at it to see it. It's actually better seen, like, if you're actually looking at my screen. Uh, YouTube compression is kind of, you know, iffy when it comes to this stuff. Uh, the midtones, I believe I adjusted the saturation up just a tad. If you bring it up too much, it becomes really obvious that it doesn't look real. 1.1 uh, worked well just to kind of get that haziness in there. Uh, because I wanted a central focus point, and I wanted that light to illuminate this area to really give it that again that memory type feel where it's like a warm fuzzy happiness uh, and that's what it was for me so i was trying my best to convey that i also adjusted the gain and brought that up as well so i brought it from the default one to 1.35 very minor tweaks it's all a lot of it's pretty subtle 
although the highlights, I think I blew them out pretty good. Like I went from one to 1.5 to make the dirt on the ground really just pop. So I wanted the, that light to have like a strong contrast. I wanted it to be contrasty, but not like horror contrast, more like fuzzy, happy contrast. Uh, and to answer Toot Moot TV, I am not using VXGI. I have heard of it. I have wanted to try it, but I have never gotten around to having the time to set it up. So unfortunately, no, I'm not using that. This is pretty much stock Unreal 4.22. No ray tracing, just some fancy, fun camera work and a basic lighting setup, uh, which again, as I, I as I always say at the end of these streams, if I can do this, you guys can do it too. It ultimately just comes down to having an eye for what you want and then just being dedicated enough to spend the time to make it. Uh, it's very easy for me to get distracted with playing Counter-Strike or something else, but... Uh, the entire weekend I was working on this and the two nights uh, after I didn't do anything but work on this I, after I was done with my work day I just right into here because I was happy I was like just in the zone I, I, I was just thrilled to make something that looked cool or at least I thought looked cool so and yes for, for anyone who's already asked questions this is definitely Unreal Engine 4 uh, this is not an overlay uh, <laughs> so let's see and yes this is in real time as well uh Again, that's, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be able to do this if it wasn't, so don't worry. We're, we're totally real-time here. We don't we do not do any smoke and mirrors at Quixel. Let's see. Checking through chat to see what else you guys have said. Okay, so Action Leet wants to know, are Megascans 3D objects UV mapped for light maps? They are not. Uh, actually, I don't believe any asset we have is set up specifically for light maps, but that's the wonders of Unreal. Let me show you. Because Unreal actually auto-generates light maps. So this is a default mesh that I actually didn't even apply the material to in here. So let me see if I actually called it what I was supposed to. Yep. Okay. Cool. So simple enough, right? Let's take a look at the UV map. So UV channel 1. This is the light map that was generated from the existing UVs. So when you brought in, or when I brought this into Unreal, the first thing I did was, after importing it, was just let Unreal work with its default settings. I didn't bother changing anything. I let it generate the UVs from its existing map. What it's going to generally do is copy what's there. Sometimes it'll organize it, sometimes it won't. Uh, I'm not knowledgeable enough there to really speak authoritatively on it. But in general, if I was to bake this with lighting, it would actually apply light maps to it. And you can even see in real time what that would look like. So I would say blue is kind of bad, really low res light maps. Green's about where you want to be. Uh, some of the, the speed tree UVs are a little interesting because of the way they blend textures together. So you'll kind of notice that there's a bit of a blending going on here. It's very tough to get those to, to match up. Uh, so it's not something I would I'd have to play with it to really kind of optimize it for what I was trying to do, which is, again, why I tend to work in dynamic mostly, because I know what I'm going to get every single time. So uh, there's no reason at all <coughs> why you couldn't bake lighting with this stuff. You would just have to come in here and change these settings. So like if I was to come to these leaves, each individual leaf, I would then go into the editor in here and let's actually go to the roots. So I'll show you how it works. So I've got the roots selected. You can see it in here. Uh, come into the... Let's see, it should be the, let me just type it in, it's faster this way. What the heck is it called? Light map, there we are. So we change the light map res to, let's say 256, and then move this out of the way, and you'll notice that the light map is now more dense. If I change it to 512, it'll be more in the green value that we want. Uh, I could do the same thing for the terrain, I believe, just by changing some values in the terrain to get it to match. There's a lot of ways you can work with this stuff. It, there's no reason why you can't use baked lighting. I just chose not to because I want it to work quickly and not have to wait for baking. That's the same reason why I use material instances. When I'm making personal art, it's all about speed and efficiency for me. Sometimes the end result is better looking if you bake. Ultimately, I think it's a better trade-off for me to make it in real time. So, let's see. Keeping up a chat here. If, like I said, if you guys have questions by any time, any any point, just feel free to ask. I, I love answering questions. Let's see here. Uh, Christian White wants to know: Do you think ray tracing and Quixel Mega Scans will be a main graphical feature used in next-gen consoles? I don't see why not. Uh, 
I don't want to talk about which specific games have already been using it, but trust me, some of your favorite games already use Mega Scans, and they're not even next gen consoles, they're current gen consoles. Uh, let's see, will Quixel ever offer an educational license to students from Jimena? Can't speak authoritatively on that. I know we are considering all options there. Don't worry, we'll see what we can do to help you guys. Uh, let's see. Chemist Chemist wants to know why sometimes Unreal has problems with FBX files. Sometimes uh, Unreal is complaining about missing smoothing groups when I import assets. That's largely something you can ignore. I had the same issue pop up in here. Uh, visually, I can't even tell the difference. Uh, it's going to generally shade it anyway. You can even tell it to you know, overwrite normals if you want, but that can cause issues with the normal map that's being applied to it if it doesn't match the same shading that was used to bake the normals. So the rule of thumb is if it looks fine and you get an error, don't worry about it. That's pretty much how it goes. Uh, let's see. Any other questions? All right, cool. Yeah, so let me see what else I can answer here. we got another 15 minutes, so you know, I, I tend to talk a lot. I'm glad you guys have the patience to deal with it. <laughs> I love nothing more than sharing knowledge, but at the same time, uh, it's good to try to keep on focus here. Uh, Dennis wants to know, would the scene take way too much time to make in 3D Studio Max? I don't see why it would. Honestly, it may have been faster to do in Max, but I don't do offline rendering. I haven't touched a, a tool like V-Ray since 2005, uh, to give you an idea of how old I am. So uh, I, I can't speak authoritatively there either, I, but I don't see any reason why you can't work quickly in an offline renderer. It's ultimately what you're more comfortable with and what you want to make and what you want to work with. The only thing that matters in terms of speed is what you can do. Uh, if you get good at the software that you're using, you will get faster at it. The more you use it, the faster you get. I've been using Unreal since, gosh, uh, 2008, 2007. So I've been using it for close to 13 years now. And I've been using Mac since 2001, so about 18 years. So I, I work quickly in Max, I work quickly in Unreal. They're, they're both tools that I feel very at home in, so that's why I work primarily with those tools. What you work with and what you find comfortable to work with, they're all ultimately going to be personal options for you, personal opinions. I can't tell you how to work, but I can tell you that uh, I think a universal truth is whatever you work best in is gonna be what you work best in. So um, <clears throat> Lost with Dan wants to know, do you ever mess around with low poly scenes? I've seen some fun cartoon styles. What is your favorite thing to create in your off time? This was my off time. Uh, I, I just made this because I just wanted to get this memory out of my head and stop forgetting to make it. I had even gone so far as to make a Google Earth pin on the specific location saying, don't forget to make this. The problem was I hadn't opened Google Earth in a long time, so I forgot to look at it. <laughs> but uh, do I ever mess around with low poly scenes? Not very much. Um, I it's not a style that really pulls me personally. I know a lot of people love it. I appreciate when people make amazing low poly work. It's just not something that I like to make. Uh, let's see. Vaklov wants to know, are the dead leaves using emissive color or is that subsurface? It's absolutely subsurface. Every little bit of that. Uh, this scene would not look anywhere near as real as it does if it was not using subsurface. You can kind of see the effect it's having right now. If it was emissive, these leaves in the shadows would actually be emitting light. So we can actually go through and control that through the material instances that I showed off earlier. So if I come in here to my leaf, which I believe is this one right here. Okay, and then pull this over. All right, you can see it looks kind of wonky in here. I don't quite understand why my shader makes everything turn gray in here. Doesn't really make any sense. There must be something that I've forgotten to check inside of Unreal. But here's what it looks like when I start playing with the subsurface values in here. So keep an eye on the screen. And if I change the subsurface strength to one, you see how much brighter it is? Two, five, 25, 500. It's all being driven by that texture. Without subsurface, this looks really flat. In fact, it doesn't look much different than the dirt but with this just a little bit of subsurface suddenly they pop into view and they look like leaves and like I just I love subsurface it's amazing and if it's done right it's incredible that it even gets done in real time the, the way these engines are optimized just completely confounds me 
uh, as, as somebody who doesn't work in programming and doesn't have no idea how this stuff is put together all I know is that I have a set of tools I can work with that I can make things with uh, so to the guys at Epic you guys are amazing I, I love that you've made these tools available for us to work with and that they're so high quality that even people like me can come in here and be like I made this Unreal Engine allowed me to do it Quixels Mega Scans allowed me to do this Speed Tree allowed me to do this and Autodesk 3ds Max allowed me to do this. All these tools that I couldn't even fathom how to program have allowed me to make this. It's it's crazy how this this world is connected to me. Um, Lost with Dan would also like to know what would you say separates the average 3D artist to a person that works at a top AAA studio? Oh boy, that's a matter of of opinion. Uh, if you want to know my opinion. A, the difference between somebody who works at a AAA studio and the difference between your average artist is oftentimes luck, knowing the right person, having the right connections, having the... It's not always even a question of skill. You, you, you're obviously going to, to jump leaps and bounds when you work on a professional production. That's a given because when you work professionally, you either get better at what you do or they let you go. There, there's really no in-between there especially not in games it's so competitive that you have to get better at what you do so uh, a triple-a artist who's been working for a while compared to someone who hasn't been doing the same level of work is going to be in general more skilled and it's going to have more skills to bring to the table wherever they go but ultimately there, there's not much of a difference between you and me and somebody who works on the next call of duty it's just a lot of it is down to connections a lot of it is down to perseverance and, and trying to get in as hard as you can to make these things that you want to make and a little bit of luck there's luck in everything you know if, if if events in my life had unfolded slightly differently i probably wouldn't be here right now so everything is down to some form of probability in the end but you do have the ability to influence that by how hard you work and how dedicated you are to making your dreams become a reality so let's see oh and teddy's in chat too so i do have some help here hi teddy Let's see, any other questions do we have? Do we have? Are there any optimization tips and tricks specifically for the assets that we make at Quixel from Dima? That's a good question. Uh, one of the major abilities that you have as an artist to optimize Megascan's assets is channel packing. Channel packing, don't even like, I can't even begin to express how amazing channel packing is. Let me, let me go over this for those of you guys who don't know what channel packing is. It is this really really awesome technique to take individual texture channels like your roughness your ambient occlusion your metalness cavity map whatever it is that you want to pack and put every one of those channels into its own individual channel inside of one image so your rg and b become three different images inside of one image so you you often get something like this which looks like a weird bit of color but it's really not it's deceptive right for those of you guys who don't know this the way I've packed this this is my ambient occlusion slash cavity map from that you then have the roughness map which is in the green channel and then from there you have nothing because normally that in the blue channel you would put metalness or whatever else you prefer to put but since nothing in this scene is metal there is no metalness so I left it as black but I was able to optimize these these assets even though they're 4k to reduce the texture overhead and combine several textures into one texture, which are then sampled basically one time by the material, which va like just drastically improves performance. The main issue dragging down performance in this scene is not the textures, is not the assets that we produce, is not the assets in the library, or even the stuff that I made with Speedtree. It is the dynamic lighting. It is the uh, distance field ambient occlusion. It is the... Um, volumetric fog if i was to run the gpu profiler right now uh, which i believe is that you will see most of this is actually coming down to let's see where's the the it's been a while since i've actually had to read this so let's see what i can do to, to decipher it for us let's see so the biggest chunk yeah post-processing it's all coming from the the distance field ambient occlusion for the most part i just wish it was easier to figure out where it's at in here ah there it is Okay, post-process, or maybe that's not it. I don't know. Anyway, the, the point being is, I mean, when I turn off DFAO, frame rate instantly improves. When I turn off dynamic lighting, frame rate instantly improves. Dynamic lighting is rarely more effective than baked lighting because everything has to be calculated per frame. 
And if you have to do that, every time that the frame updates, you are going to run slow, which is why this runs slow. There is no getting around that. I specifically chose this particular style of work because I wasn't going to be demonstrating this in real time, uh, like for a game. Like for streams, it's okay. It doesn't have to be 60 frames. You guys get the gist of this. You can see like when I turn away from all the shadows, it speeds up. When I turn back, it turns choppy. If this was being made for a game, I would have found ways to get those volumetric rays, maybe by using meshes, maybe by finding ways to optimize the way the, the fog looks. There's a ton of different techniques you can use to optimize things, but ultimately the assets themselves are not the slowdown. It is the techniques that I use to render this scene. That's an important uh, bit of information to keep in mind. Uh, just because it runs, like it looks like it runs slow here, is not an indication that the Megascans assets are the problem. It, it is definitely dynamic lighting causing this. Uh, so Chemist Chemist wants to know, is there any option to pack channels and bridge or before downloading? There actually is. Uh, fun fact, you can pack channels and bridge, which is great because when you go to export, you can go to the advanced settings and then you can pack channels right there and you can tell exactly which ones you want to put in. So this is not set to how I normally have it set. I like roughness and green because from what I've understood so far, the green channel is the least compressed out of all of them. So the roughness is the, the most important map to me. Uh, metalness, you know, I would put in blue and or red. Really, it's all personal preference, however you want to work or the studio you're at wants you to work. Just follow that format. But yeah, you can absolutely do that with Bridge and you can kick it right out using the Live Link plugin and it will come right in. So it's, it's pretty cool. We, we try to make this as seamless as possible for you guys. I mean, again, our, our entire philosophy here is to try to make art more accessible to the masses so that everybody can do this. It's not just something that like the AAA guys can do. Um, a lot of, you know, I, I don't want to name names and it's not my place, but a lot of major companies use Megascans now and a lot of stuff that you've played and seen, you would be surprised what has it. it it's, it's everywhere. It's crazy. And it's just because of how easy it is to use, how well these textures and these materials integrate themselves. I, like I said, I wouldn't have been able to make a scene of this caliber on my own. Uh, because of the way we, we've scanned these assets, because of the assets that we have scanned in this incredible library that we have, I was able to produce this. And I'm just happy because, I mean, it let me make something that I've always wanted to, to make. So back to chat. So Katsuri199 wants to know if Megascans is worth getting for a beginner in Unreal. He finds it hard to find assets. Also, what are other programs that we can use for blockouts? Does Blender work? Absolutely, Blender works. Uh, I use Max only because of inertia. Not that Max has any problems. I love Max. I've been using it forever. But I've been using Max for so long that I can't really conceive of switching to Blender. So I use Max. That's just what I'm pr uh, personally proficient in. I work quickly in Max. There's no reason why you can't work with Blender. I know many people who do. Uh, Blender is a great tool. And ultimately, like like with any tool out there, you should use what you're comfortable with. Is Megascans something good for beginners? Sure. Uh, with the LiveLink plugin, it does a lot of the work of setting these materials up for you. I like to work with my own materials. So uh, for those of you who are still new, and I know there's a couple of guys in here who, who haven't really used materials before and don't really know what this is, um, it looks frightening and intimidating at first. Uh, when I first built materials in UDK back in 2008, I had no idea what the heck a, a multiply node was or, or any of this other stuff was. I had to figure it out. But a lot of that figuring out has been done for you with the live link. It comes in with its own material. You come, it comes preset, pre-calibrated, ready to go with instances that you have total control over, just like these materials here. Just like this Spanish moss material, you come with all these different controls that you can play with to get the values that you want to see that look aesthetically pleasing to you, that allow you to focus on what you want to make. That's ultimately, I mean, regardless of how uh, proficient you are with Unreal, it takes a lot of the guesswork out of it and it brings it into a more accessible level for like, everybody. I mean, even, even some really advanced people in Unreal find it hard to work with materials. There's some materials I can't even begin to fathom, and I've been working with this tool for 13 years. Like, you want to, if you ask me how to make a world-aligned texture that, that only goes up on the Z-axis, but all the UVs are in different directions, I don't know how to do that. 
I would have to look that up and spend the better part of a night to figure out how to make a, a light flow up in one direction regardless of UV direction. There's a lot of stuff that's tough. And it doesn't matter if you're, you know, you're, you've been using it as long as I have or even longer. There's some stuff you're never going to know. And sometimes it's easier if things are done for you so that you can just focus on making things that you think look cool. So let's see. Any other questions? We're starting to get ready to wrap up. I got a few minutes left. I don't mind going a little over, but at the same time, I don't want to overstay my welcome. So uh, Sajid wants to know is 8 gigabytes, 1050, 8 gigabytes of RAM, and an i5 sufficient for starting Unreal? Absolutely. Uh, Unreal was built in, or Unreal 4 was made in 2014, if I recall correctly. Those specs far exceed anything that was available at the time. You can probably run Unreal on a 4 gig machine. Um, would I recommend it? Probably not, but 8 gigs should work just fine. I would just be cognizant of how much RAM you have and just try to remember that ultimately the, the main bottleneck is going to be how much you can actually put into the scene. I've got 32 gigs, so I can load more into my scene than some people can, but there's even limits to how far I can go with this stuff. So... And Chemist Chemist would also like to know, is there any tutorial from us on how to properly step-by-step -step set up the live link in Unreal? We actually have that on our YouTube channel. Uh, we did set that up already. We, I, I believe we can probably get a link to that in the comments. Um, and if you guys still have issues after looking at the, the video tutorial, you could always reach out to us at support at quixel.com and we will be glad to assist you with getting set up. I mean, we're here for you guys. We want to make sure you're happy with what we make. So ultimately what we do is to, you know, ensure that you guys get up to, up to speed and you're, and you're good to go. Uh, do I have anything in mind for my next project? I do don't really want to talk about it too much because if I was to load it right now, it would look kind of goofy because it's in pre-production stage, but it is my college capstone project from almost nine years ago that uh, my wife really loves. And because for those of you who are married, you do everything to make your wife happy. I figured why not spend a couple of minutes figuring out how to make this become a reality and then spend the rest of these weeks trying to build this thing into, into something. It's going to involve trees. It's probably going to involve volumetrics. It will hopefully look cool. It might have a bit of a fantasy vibe to it. I'm hoping I'm not getting out of my element here. I was very lucky that I was able to pull off what I did here. Uh, even more so lucky that I was able to even share what I'm doing with you guys. Uh, I, I feel very honored to do that. So I'm, I'm glad that you guys are here to, to, to talk and, and see and ask questions. Um, but that being said, we have one more minute left. So if you guys have any additional questions or you know comments or just want to say hi, by all means, feel free to. Oh, uh, you know what? Actually, one other thing too. Let me let me show you guys what this looks like when I start taking these bushes out of here. When when somebody mentioned earlier that it was a genius move to hide or put the trees in the ground. <laughs> Again, this is this is not something I would recommend doing at a a triple a studio you're going to make bushes but look at how much different this scene looks when i take out all these trees that i used as bushes all right now let's go back into the camera really kind of brought the scene together i think when you see just how desolate it is outside and how like oh god bright that's bright that even hurts my eyes but if i unhide everything suddenly it looks like there's more than there really is and uh I hate to say it, but a lot of what we do as artists is not always, you know, creating exactly what is there, but sometimes just creating the illusion of what's there. So it doesn't really matter if those are bushes, as long as they look good. I mean, it, that's that's ultimately what matters. If you can make it look good and you can get it done in time for whether you have a deadline or if it's just you trying to personally get faster at what you're doing. If you can find tips and tricks along the way to make it look good and, and nobody can tell the difference, go for it. There's Nobody's going to judge you. So um, that's pretty much it. I think I can uh, wrap this up now. We should be back next Friday. And I also wanted to mention that we will have an upcoming Blender tutorial and live stream maybe next week. It may be the week after, but we are definitely doing it. I know some of you guys are Blender aficionados. And, you know, it's time for us to get Blender some love, not just Unreal Engine. 
So I can't wait to see what you guys are going to say about that. Ultimately, we're, we're trying to cover everything we can. So if it takes a little bit of time and it, it feels like we haven't gotten to your favorite software yet, don't worry. We eventually will. So, um, yeah. So Blender, guys, keep in mind, it's coming up soon. That being said, uh, like I said, I'm Jonathan, Quixel's Community Manager. It's amazing to be here with you guys. Thanks for coming in, and we'll see you guys next time.